Right, so I'll be talking today about the connection between creaky voice and gender. Uh, creaky voice has been recognized as a feature of young women's speech, perhaps more than any other prosodic feature apart from rising declaratives. Um, and this connection has been drawn in both popular media as well as scholarly research on creaky voice. Um, part of the appeal of gender is that it's everywhere, right? Its effects can be felt in every social interaction. Uh, but in scholarly work that identifies correlations between gender categories and linguistic practice, we too often fail to look beyond those categories to explain why gender categories arise. So I want to argue that in situated interaction, creaky voice serves a negative disengaged affective function. And it's this interactionally rooted function that could underlie gender differences in the use of creek. I'll be concerned with two main questions today. First, is it really the case that women, and young women in particular, produce higher rates of creek than other speakers? Um, I'll investigate this issue through a quantitative variation of study of 93 speakers from California. Uh, and second, why is it that women and men produce so much creaky voice? Uh, rather than classifying individuals as creakers versus not, it would be illuminating to compare the conditions under which speakers use creak versus when they don't, um, since we all exhibit intraspeaker variation in phonation. Um, and I'll, I'll investigate this issue by testing for correlations between creaky voice and non-vocal expressions of that. Uh, to begin with, let's consider how creek is represented in the media. Uh, well, some headlines invoke metaphors of disease, which apparently young women are more uh, susceptible to. Um, other representations uh, avoid talking about gender explicitly and instead provide a list of prototypical creakers, like Britney Spears, Kim Kardashian, and Zoe Deschanel, leaving the reader to draw their own conclusions about what these three people have in common. Uh, this particular example also shows that creaking is something one can be guilty of, uh, and this final example explicitly characterizes creaky voice as a much reviled phenomenon. Uh, what these and other media treatments of creak reveal is that creak is ideologized as a feature of young women's speech, and not a very nice one. Uh, these ideologies were expressed in an episode of the popular linguistics podcast, Lexington Valley, in which one of the hosts describes creaky voice as vulgar, repulsive, mindless, and annoying. He wants, quote, the oil to stop. Uh, fortunately, some counter discourses about creek have emerged. Um, Pat Keating has pointed out, contrary to many claims in the media, that producing creek is not physiologically harmful. Um, and in an article in <laughs> and in an article in the Atlantic, uh, Gabriel Arana nicely points out that creaky voice is simply a linguistic innovation, and women are at the forefront of change. He goes on to say that the story of language is one of the dominant political group trying to. Uh, trying to fix the linguistic code in place, and those below them pushing and pulling it loose. And it's especially when talking about gender, if we're thinking about it properly, that we can expose power relations. Um, that's going to be part of the story. But we shouldn't view power strictly through the lens of gender categories. Right? In situated interaction, we don't always deliberately choose one phonetic form over another to produce or perform a gender category. Of course, this is variable, and under some conditions, we do do that, uh, which is, I think, a point that we'll talk about next. Um, but our choice of one form over another is often tied to how we're engaging in the interaction at hand. So more on that in the second part of the talk. Uh, but before we go there, we need to ask whether it's actually the case that young women are creaking more than other groups. Um, a few quantitative studies suggest that this is the case, in varieties of American English at least. Uh, but these studies are limited in a few ways. Um, in a perfect world, we'd have a larger number of speakers. We'd also control for regional dialect. Um, we'd also look at longer samples of spontaneous speech. Um, if it's the case that creek expresses affect, uh, we would want to avoid red speech, uh, since it's less likely to occasion prosodic expressions of affect. Um, and finally, we'd want an age-stratified speaker sample to see if creaking is a particularly young women's Uh, the data that I'll be using is the Voices of California corpus. Uh, Voices of California is a Stanford Linguistics Department effort to document the diversity of dialects across the state of California, um, or at least outside of LA and San Francisco, which we know something about already. Um, every September, a group of 10 to 15 visits a different field site um, and conducts hour-long social linguistic interviews with a sample of the speakers uh, that roughly approximates the social composition of the community. And so to date, we've collected data in seven communities, um, and the corpus consists of over 800 interviews. Uh, today, I'll be focusing on the first three field sites uh, where we collected data, Reading, Merced, and Bakersfield, which span the, uh, the Central Valley 
Uh, so I've analyzed data for 93 white speakers, um, at least 30 from each, speak, each community. Um, I'm considering the speech of white speakers only for this part of the study, uh, since European Americans are the only ethnic group that constitute more than 5% of the population in all three field sites. Um, we can talk more about whether this type of sampling practice is the right approach in the Q&A if you want. I'm not convinced that it is at all. Um, within each field site, roughly half are cisgender women and half are cisgender men. Um, and within each cell formed by crossing field site and gender, we've got speakers representing uh, the full adult life course from late teens to old age. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll talk about the methods just very quickly. Um, all interviews were porous aligned, and we took measurements for a number of acoustic dimensions every 10 milliseconds. These included measures of spectral tilt, like H1 star minus H2 star, um, and uh, measures of periodicity, periodicity such as CPPS. Um, for each vowel, we reduced the data to the median value for each acoustic measure, um, excluding very short and very long, uh, very long vowels and outliers in any of the acoustic dimensions. Um, and we also ran the data through Canadol's creek detector. Um, so we used that to classify each vowel as creaky versus not. Um, for our statistical methods, uh, we constructed three mixed effects uh, models, one for each of our approaches to characterizing creek. Um, each model included a number of random intercepts and several linguistic uh, predictor predictors. The most important of these for our purposes is gonna be phrase position. Um, we also examined the social factors, gender, age, field site, and orientation to the land. Um, by orientation to the land, I mean whether speakers earn their living off the land. Um, and over the course of conducting our field work in the Central Valley, uh, we discovered that this was an important distinction for people there, um, since uh, a lot of, of speakers engage in farming and ranching or work in the oil industry. So this is really like a class variable for this particular study, though we should point out that it doesn't really correlate with uh, income, let's say. So people that own farms, for example, would be considered pretty high on the socioeconomic hierarchy, but um, we would classify them as being oriented to the land since their livelihood depends on it. Okay, uh, again, in the interest of time, I'm gonna discuss uh, the results of just the logistic regression that models whether uh, syllables are realized as creaky or not. Um, starting with the main effects, as we would expect, there was an effect of phrase position where creek is more common as you approach the ends of phrases. Um, there were also effects of gender and age, whereby women and younger speakers, respectively, uh, were more likely to creak. Um, both gender and age interacted with other factors, though, so I'll hold off on discussing them for a little bit. Um, speakers whose livelihoods depend on the land exhibit less creaky voice than those who do not. Okay? So I, another, I guess another way of saying that is people who don't earn their, earn their living off the land are less likely to creak. Um, and there have been past proposals that have characterized Creek as a more urban area. Um, but at any rate, this pattern recalls similar patterns coming out of the Voices of California project for other phonetic variables, such as um, voice quality, the realization, or excuse me, vowel quality, the realization of S, and the strength of voicing during stop closures. All of those are um, structured by whether people earn their living off the land or not. Okay. So this is an isolated. Um, in the next two slides, I'm gonna pick apart the two uh, main interactions. Okay, so this figure depicts the interaction between age and phrase position. Um, the results re reveal that even though uh, the use of creaky voice does indeed depend on a speaker's age, uh, that the effect of age depends on what part of the phrase we're talking about. Okay. So we see upward sloping lines for all age groups, showing that creaky voice is much more common at the ends of phrases. Um, every speaker, regardless of age, frequently speaks in creaky voice at the ends of phrases, and this is like 20 to 30% of the time phrase final. Okay. Um, younger speakers have begun to produce even more creaky voice in this expected position. Okay, so we see the most age differentiation here. Um, but the younger speakers have also begun to produce creaky voice in less expected positions in the utterance, including at the very beginnings of phrases. Um, the oldest speakers never creak in this position. The, old, the two oldest groups here are at zero phrase initially. Um, so with respect to the question of whether creaky voice is a new feature, the answer is yes and no. Okay, so everyone creaks a fair amount phrase finally, uh, uh, but younger people creak even more there and have expanded the prosodic domain over which creak can be produced, uh, permitting creak at earlier, even initial parts of the phrase. Okay. Um, and this may be one of the reasons why creak has risen above the level of consciousness and entered mainstream discourse. Um, this pattern shows the interaction between gender and 
So here I'm showing you the patterns for H1 star minus H2 star, which is an acoustic correlate of uh, glottal constriction. Um, it's just easier to show you with a continuous predictor than a categorical one, like plus or minus creepy. Um, but the same interaction that we're getting here between gender and age is evident whether we binarily categorize creepy as plus or minus, or whether we operationalize it continuously. So we can see the main effect of gender, uh, where women have a lower H1 minus H2 and are thus creepier than men across the age range. Okay? But the interaction between gender and age complicates this pattern. So first, younger men uh, produce similarly strong creaky voice to women of the same age range. Um, and the youngest men are um, actually um, more strongly creaky than the middle-aged women. Okay. Uh, the overall difference between women and men appears to be mostly driven by the older men, who are generally found to use a breathier voice quality. Uh, second, women exhibited a curvilinear pattern across the age range, uh, such that the youngest and oldest women produce the strongest creak. Uh, Middle-aged women, by contrast, produce the least strongly creaky speech. We attribute the highest incidence of creak among the older women uh, to vocal aging. Uh, the oldest men also appear to show signs of vocal aging, but their surfaces in breathier inclination. Okay, so they're similarly uh, aperiodic, uh, non-modal, but um, just different in their degree of glottal constriction. Uh, so to return to our first question, uh, do young, uh, young women uh, creep the most? The answer is yes, but it's more complicated than that. Uh, young men and the oldest women creep a lot too. Um, it's also worth pointing out that a focus on gender alone can obscure other relevant dimensions of social differentiation, such as orientation to the land in this particular study. Um, in spite of these complications, I'm not trying to question whether young women are creaking the most. Um, the data speak to that. Um, it just doesn't explain, it doesn't explain anything to make this generalization, right? And if explanatory adequacy is our goal, then we need to be able to answer a different question, which is, what do people like young, white, cisgender women, or otherwise, use creaky voice to do? Uh, so I want to briefly return to media treatments of creak, since at least a couple of linguists have uh, shed light on this issue. Um, as Carmen Fott has pointed out, young women take linguistic features and use them as power tools for building relationships. I love that imagery there. Okay. Um, and Penny Eckert adds, they're using them to achieve some kinds of interactional and stylistic end. Okay. But what are these uh, interactional and stylistic ends? Well, I want to play an example from an interview uh, where the speaker Jessica uses extensive creek. And uh, I just want you to think about what creek might be doing for her here. Hopefully it's going to be loud enough. Hey, when your parents get a divorce? Uh, Shortly after we had moved there, they were in the process of getting a divorce. So we moved up there, and then they decided to get a divorce and move back. Work by linguists, uh, particularly with those taking a discourse analytic approach, suggests that speakers can strategically use creaky voice to show disengagement or express negative affect, which is what I think is going on in the example that we just heard. Um, Shine Lee, in her 2015 paper, shows that speakers commonly slip into creaky voice when they go off topic for a bit, suggesting that creaky voice distances parenthetical speech from the main thread of a conversation. And she goes on to argue that speakers can draw on this conventional function of creaky voice to distance themselves from the issue under discussion, and even, um, even when the speech is on, on topic. And Grivicic and Nylev um, advance a similar claim in their analysis of the word yeah in telephone uh, they argue that creaky yeah expresses either a disalignment between interlocutors or a dispreference to continue on the current topic. They gloss this as passive recipiency. I mean, finally, in perhaps the most detailed line-to-line -line examination of creaky discourse to date, uh, Zimin uh, shows that a transmasculine speaker draws on creak to index a stance of disaffectation, an aloof persona, or, the, or a kind of emotional stoicism. So in all these studies, uh, creaky voice serves a useful interactional function to distance the speaker from either their addressee or the topic of discussion. Um, the recurrence of this function suggests that it may carry a more stable or at least partially context-free meaning. The question is whether we can find quantitative evidence for this proposal in a larger data set. Um, of course, undertaking a principled discourse analysis on a range of socially diverse uh, speakers wouldn't be realistic. I'm hoping Lal will agree with me on this. <laughs> um, uh, but we can turn to other domains of language besides discourse and even other modalities besides speech to draw inferences about how speakers are affectively positioning 
So basically, we can test the hypothesis that speakers use Creek to convey negative disengaged affect. Um, and we can do so across modalities. So starting with the most direct expression of affect, we can consider speakers' own assessments of interactions. Well, we should observe an inverse correlation between how comfortable speakers feel in interactions and how much they creak. And we should observe the same inverse correlation between how much speakers enjoy their interactions and how much they creep. Uh, we can also look at the uh, affect or sentiment conveyed through the lexical or semantic material of speech. Right? Beginning with a lexicon, if creep conveys negative affect, we should observe more creep on negatively valenced words. Right? If it conveys disengagement, we should also observe more creep on low arousal words and words that express lower dominance. And by similar logic, we would expect to find more creak in utterances that express negative sentiment. Uh, finally, we can consider the least, least explicit expression of affect, embodied affect. If creak indexes negative affect, we would expect to see higher rates when people are not smiling. Right? And if creak conveys disengagement, we would expect to see higher rates when people are moving their bodies less. Right? In the interest of time, I'm not going to get into previous work that established this establishes the connection between affect and forms of embodiment. So just take my word for it. Yeah. All right, so to test these hypotheses, we need audiovisual data where speakers are interacting in a relatively, le a relatively comfortable environment. I mean, it wouldn't uh, hurt to also have explicit assessments of how people experience their interactions. Um, embodied practices are generally best collected in more natural, less overtly experimental contexts. Okay. But voice quality practices are best carried out um, the voice quality studies are best uh, carried out on pristine audio recordings, which are, be are best collected in sound booths, right, or the kinds of experimental context we're trying to avoid for the collection of the embodiment data. Okay. Um, so to address these competing demands, we collected the data in an interactional sociophonetics laboratory. Um, so the part of the lab that's shown here in this photo um, is staged like a living room, right, with the hope that speakers will relax into the environment and interact more or less naturally. Uh, but the room also has the acoustical specifications of a sound booth, so the resultant audio recordings are of high quality with minimal noise. Um, although speakers knew that they were being video recorded, uh, cameras were put in inconspicuous locations, like inside the decorative boxes on the shelves. There are little holes that were in exactly the right position for the lens of the camera. <laughs> Lucked out in finding those. Thank you, Ikea. Um, <laughs> and then we drilled hole, holes in the face of a clock and put a, a camera there as well. Um, so speakers were recorded in dyads, uh, with one speaker sitting on a chair and the other um, opposite them on a couch um, with a coffee table in between. And for each speaker, we have a separate video recording that captures the speaker head on. Okay? We needed to get this particular angle because most of the computer vision methods which we used um, were developed for video blog data, which generally features a single speaker uh, sitting in front of a webcam. Um, we also have separate uh, audio files for, per speaker, which as it turns out makes the transcription faster and the aligning more accurate. Um, speakers were recorded with wireless lavalier microphones. Um, for the majority of the recordings, which lasted about 30 minutes, speakers participated in unscripted conversation. Okay? And they had the aid of prompts if desired. The props were, uh, prompts were presented on, on a large Rolodex uh, on the coffee table in between them. We didn't want to put them on paper because they would fiddle with the paper and that would compromise the audio. Um, and the props would ask questions that encourage reflection on identity construction. So these were things like, how has the way you dress changed over the last five years? This might get people to reflect on their gender presentation, on their, um, their, their presentation of age or going through different life stages, um, but without explicitly asking. Uh, following the recording, speakers filled out an ele electronic survey in which they provided demographic information and also assessed the interaction, answering questions like how comfortable did you feel, how much did you enjoy the interaction. That's where those questions came from earlier. Uh, so just to give you a sense of what the video data looked like, how much time do I have? Ten minutes. You can look at that uh, in the question and answer period if you want. <laughs> uh, so the Living Room Corpus um, currently has data for about 150 speakers. I mean, the data for today come from 42 speakers. Um, they're the ones from the Western United States, so we wanted to control for regional dialect. Um, and um, their data are currently transcribed and alive. Okay. So of these 42 speakers, 26 are cisgender women, 16 cisgender men. Um, and as you might expect, the sample skews toward the young end, 25 are undergraduates aged 
uh, 18 to 22, while 17 are older adults, mostly in their 20s and early 30s. Uh, the sample is also reasonably diverse in terms of other dimensions of identity. So for example, half the speakers are people of color and nearly a quarter of the speakers do not identify as straight. All right, so for the acoustic analysis of Creek, um, I follow the same methods that I talked about in the first study. Um, to assess words and phrases for valence, arousal, and dominance, I use the lexicons recently published by Muhammad. Um, so essentially, uh, humans rated 20,000 English words for valence, which corresponds to the negative to positive dimension of emotion, arousal, uh, which corresponds to the calm to excited dimension, and dominance, which corresponds to weak to powerful. Um, scores range from zero to one for all of these scales. Okay. So a word like emptiness would be rather low in valence, arousal, and dominance. Okay. This contrasts with menace, which is similarly negative, but much higher in arousal and dominance. Okay. Champion would be positive in valence, high in arousal and high in dominance. Okay? Whereas floral would be similarly positive, but much lower in arousal and dominance. Um, a major issue with the list of words approach that I just talked about is that it doesn't treat meaning as compositional, which is especially problematic when we're dealing with phenomena like negation. Okay? So that's where the Stanford NLP sentiment analysis algorithm comes in. Um, so this approach uses NLP to parse an utterance, and the sentiment of each node of the tree is determined. So as a result, this utterance uh, here is correctly labeled as having a negative sentiment. Um, if we use the valence lexicon, the utterance ends up being quite neutral rather than negative. So the sentiment analysis algorithm is going to capture the utterance level sentiment better. Okay. So to identify when speakers are smiling, we developed a computer vision technique to automate coding. Um, manual sm smiling annotation can be subject to human error, not to mention extremely time. Um, we used an open source corpus of photographs that were hand annotated for the presence of smiling. Uh, the corpus comes that way. Um, and we trained a classifier on the basis of it. Okay? And then each frame of the video was run through the classifier. So here's an example of how five frames might be classified. Um, to quantify how much speakers are moving, we used a method from our paper um, on the connection between movement and prosody body movement prosody. Basically, the method compares the value of each pixel to that in the following frame of the video. Okay? So you can start with a video like this. Okay, so um, basically, I'll just start from like my beginning of the day and then yeah, I'll continue like what happens the rest of the day. Okay, so you see lots of different types of movement, right? Her eyes are moving around, she's speaking, those are all generating movement. There are gestures and there's also like fixing the hair, which is probably not considered a co-speech gesture. Um, so this video here dynamically shows changes in pixel value, okay? So wherever you see white, um, there's been a movement there, okay? And you can add, a, add up the number of activated pixels in each frame um, to get a, a dynamic representation or a waveform of how much movement there is over time, okay? And then you can see whether that correlates with the incidence of creep. Importantly, this doesn't quantify gesture, right? So we are not saying anything about whether particular movements are meaningful, right? Um, they, um, they're just there. It's a more holistic measure of movement. All right, so um, I wanna talk about the results really quickly. So um, here I'm repeating the chart of predictions that I presented earlier with an additional result column here. I mean, we can see that of the eight predictions, four were borne out. So from top to bottom, we have uh, four trends. So first, creaky voice is more prevalent in interactions that speakers rated as less enjoyable. Um, so creaky voice is also used more commonly on words that convey less dominance. Okay. And finally, creaky voice correlated with both forms of embodiment. So creaky voice was more common in phrases where people were not smiling. Um, it's important to note that this pattern obtained only for the female speakers um, who constituted the majority of the, um, the sample. Um, finally, regardless of gender, speakers creaked more at moments of time when they were moving less. Okay? So this recalls a similar finding in Teresa Pratt's recent dissertation. Um, with, this was a year-long ethnography of students at a high school for the performing arts. And she found that students in the school drew a distinction between kids who were considered chill and those who were considered higher energy louds. So louds is actually a word that they use to describe themselves. Um, so she found that chill students not only shifted their sitting positions less over the course of social linguistic interviews, um, but they also use higher rates of creaky voice when doing so. Okay, so it's a similar finding. 
All right, it's noteworthy that all four significant results, which span all three modalities considered, uh, were in the predicted direction, which indicates that the data largely support the hypothesis that creaky voice conveys negative disengaged affect. Um, at this stage, it's unclear why we failed to observe correlations between creak and other forms of affect expression. Um, it could be because there's no such connection. Um, it could also be because there isn't enough statistical power. Um, this could especially be the case for the self-reports of comfort levels, since we collected a single rating for each interaction as a whole. Right? It might be worthwhile to use a crowdsourcing platform to obtain dynamic assessments of interactions as they unfold. That way, a whole interaction wouldn't have a single comfort uh, uh, level, but would uh, change over the course of the interaction. Um, and it, finally, it could be that some methods that we use are insufficiently robust to capture um, affect in a, in, a, in a useful way. So th I think this might be the case for something like sentiment analysis, since the method was developed on the basis of text-based uh, movie reviews. Okay? These are generally much easier to parse than the spontaneous messy speech of our corpus, which contains a lot of false starts. Uh, okay, so taking the results together, uh, we see that young women do, in, in point of fact, uh, creak more than others, so we can revisit the question of why. Um, well, we've also seen that regardless of gender, people creak more when they're moving less on words that convey lower dominance and in less enjoyable interactions. So is it possible that women move less, use less dominant lexical items, or enjoy interactions less than men? Um, so I ran the models and no, there's no, uh, there's no difference between women and men in that regard. Okay. So young women's greater use of creak is therefore not a consequence of more frequently producing negative disengaged stances in those other modalities that I considered. Uh, rather, women use creek more because they appear to prefer creek as a means of enacting such stances. Um, but why are young women and others conveying negative disengaged stances with creek? Um, because the social meaning of creek, even though it's interactionally relevant, does not contribute to the referential meaning of the utterance that carries it. Okay? Uh, because this meaning is not at issue, speakers can express affect without doing so directly. And in fact, Eckert has argued that, uh, that a design feature of language is being able to convey social meaning, including affect, without expressing it through lexical content. As a result, we can't respond to someone who's creaking by asking them something like, why are you disengaging from me? <laughs> the disengagement is in the room, but it's not on the table, so to speak. So the plausible deniability of disengagement, as expressed through creaky voice, is useful in a world where we experience linguistic practices like mansplaining and manterruptions. Right? It's a way of saying without saying and without escalating interactions. Um, but what exactly are we saying? Um, I've glossed the social meaning of creaky voice as negative disengaged affect. And to a point, I'm happy with this gloss because I think it's a lot better than young female as a meaning. Okay? Um, but we can probably do better. Right? So the negative part of this gloss refers to an, ev an evaluative stance of a stance object, whereas disengagement refers to the alignment between interactives. Okay? So is it evaluative stance, alignment, both, or something slightly different but related? Um, a negative step, or a negative step, a next step in this project, hopefully it's a positive step, uh, will be uh, to be more precise in formalizing the meaning of creaky voice. And what I have in mind is something like what um, Erez was saying about uh, Sonia Jung's work. Um, in her uh, work on assertive rising declaratives, right? So in utterances like, my name is Anna, or um, I'll be your waitress, or uh, hi, I'm Mark Liverman. <laughs> uh, uh, according to Jung's analysis, what's going on here in terms of meaning? Well, you're first saying that the speaker is committed to the proposition expressed by the declarative, and you're introducing this metalinguistic issue. Um, and Jung finds that uh, listeners perceive these assertive rising declaratives as more polite, which directly follows from the semantic pragmatic analysis, right? They sound more polite because the act of introducing a metalinguistic issue is another oriented practice, okay? Um, connections between assertive rising declaratives and gender can arise for similar reasons. Women might be viewed as the quintessential uptalkers because they've been socialized to introduce metalinguistic issues uh, to the table, okay? So in this example, uh, gendered meanings follow from the core pragmatics, right? And I think something similar could be going on with creaky voice, um, but we're not there yet, okay, in terms of our analytical understanding. All right, so it's not the case that creaky voice isn't associated with gender, right? I wanna be clear that I'm not claiming that. It's just that gender is the product of the linguistic practice of creaking, not the explanation for it. Uh, so my point here is that gender can't be the whole story. Right? If we obsess over it, we run the risk of missing out on other important social factors like whether people are earning their living off the land or their expressions of affect. Okay? Um, 
The prevalence of creep uh, among women is less about gender per se than the expression of affect, which can neither be separated from nor reduced to gender. Okay? A final point I want to underscore is that creaky voice is interactionally useful, allowing speakers to express affective stance without communicating it overtly. Okay? This is a point worth emphasizing from a, an applied perspective, because doing so helps to combat the sexism that underlies a lot of um, linguistic ideologies about creep. Um, people aren't creaking because they're women or because they're annoying. They're doing it because it's a savvy way to manage interaction. Uh, but the particulars of how creaky voice is interactionally useful are also linguistic facts without, the which, with, without which any description of linguistic structure would be incomplete. Thank you. I'm not sure how to answer that question. I would want to engage with that work a bit more. Lewis is actually my student now, but I wasn't working with him on this particular project, so I'm not very familiar with the uh, particulars of the argument. Can you maybe restate? Um, yeah, so I mean, um, I guess it's just, it's interesting uh, that uh, he found that Lady Gaga uses Creek to express authenticity um, and that Creek also means like a Okay, I don't know, I, I'll just say, I don't know how those two particular meanings interact, but I do think we do need to figure out how um, these, these kind of, I guess what I'm calling more core meanings of affect might um, index other types of meanings at different orders of indexing quality, okay? And so an example that I was thinking of, so I, I think uh, there have been some proposals that Creek can index a kind of cool persona, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that this disengagement or this dis distancing, right? So in Sinead Lee's work, um, there's a distancing of, distancing of this current chunk of discourse from the main thread of discourse, right? At a higher level of indexicality, that can be used to distance a person from the topic or a person from another person. And maybe if we engage in that type of practice long enough, right, there can be a coolness, right? If, we're, if I'm someone that always engages in, engages in this, practices, the pra this practice of distancing, um, a coolness, like a more durative coolness, uh, might be a, a reading that emerges uh, from that. So I would want to pursue this connection between um, uh, authenticity and, um, and uh, what was the other one? Disengagement. Okay, yeah. Uh, I would want to pursue that along a similar type of uh, reasoning. Yeah. Other questions for students? Yeah. Uh, so we used Kane et al.'s method. They, they have a 2013 paper, which is basically a neural network model that does a binary classification of creek versus not. Okay. So we just borrowed that off the shelf. Um, Kane et al., 2013. Um, yeah. Uh, other questions from students? Yeah. 
I haven't observed that. So like in the living room data that I was talking about, the, the, uh, the, the sample really skews toward the young end. So people are generally, it's usually a young person talking to another young person, right? Um, so we don't have the kind of diversity to investigate that question. Um, in the Voices of California data, we kind of have a similar um, situation going on in the sense that generally uh, the younger field workers interview the younger um, interviewees and uh, the older faculty members <laughs> um, are the people who generally interview the older people. Um, so we, again, we don't have that diversity to, to see what's going on. Um, so yeah, I don't have a good answer to that question. I'm sorry? The gender? The, I haven't looked at, at, at those possible effects, but I'm sure, uh, yeah, that should be something that I look at. Yeah, I mean, just highlighting this notion of interaction, um, one of the things we want to do as, as a next step is look at like accommodation, right? So what happens when you've got people that, are, that have maybe some baseline different rates of creek, what is happening over the course of their interactions, and how might that relate to how people are affectively Um, this is very popular on Twitter, by the way. They love Creek on Twitter. Um, <laughs> so I like this so much, and especially sort of in light of what Erez was talking about, because what it seems that uh, you're saying here is that this is a, an indexical resource that speakers can draw on, given that there's this kind of gender world ideology around it. So the young women are able to use this like, quality feature to do kind of politeness even, even while doing a disaffected stance, right? Um, but I wonder how that works for speakers who have a different sort of stereotype about them, right? So the idea here is that the young women are able to use this um, to sort of be negative, even though they're not supposed to be negative. But if you're a speaker who is already presumed to be negative, I wonder what happens sort of in this case. And, and in light of errors, is right people's expectations for what this like, quality thing or this pathetic thing is doing are different on different people, like the meaning of the thing. So basically, you have all of these other speakers who are not white and who are not women. Maybe, do you have any sort of intuition that Creek does something else for them, given that they are stereotyped in a different way? I don't have an intuition that, that Creek necessarily does something else. Like, so I, won't, I, I don't want to point my finger at any particular meetings, right? But given this indexical situation that we were talking about, right, that Creek maybe has like a, a core meaning that can, can at higher at levels of indexicality index other things, right? We've got, the result of that would be like, maybe we could call it an indexical field, right? And I would say for sure, certain meanings in that indexical field are going to be foregrounded for certain types of speakers versus others. Um, so I think there's room for that in the theory for this type of situation to arise. So if we observed it empirically, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, but I don't, I, I don't have particular predictions about which kinds of uh, connections people might be drawn. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was, I was, <laughs> yeah. I just have a quick question following up on Yale's question, uh, um, which is about, um, because I, uh, so I have the, 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 I share all these intuitions, but I, uh, I share a, a, an additional intuition sort of related to, to um, what uh, Gil was saying about Lewis's work. Um, so uh, basically, uh, I can imagine a scenario where I'm like using my creep to, to not distance myself, but to bring the, my interlocutor in with me, where I like lean in and I just like tell you a secret um, and a kind of thing. And so, uh, and so I wonder uh, what kinds of unification we do to, like, sort of, sort of like Sunny did in her, in her work to unify these two apparently contradictory uh, types of meanings. I wonder what types of things you could do for that. Sure. So, I mean, I think another thing to recognize is that Creek, what I'm calling Creek, with a single label, yeah. is a phonetically multidimensional right. sure. um, thing. And so there's also, so yeah, Creek uh, is, um, you could say that it's, um, distancing because some of it's acoustic characteristics, right? But you could say that it brings people closer together because generally it is quieter, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so there, it kind of iconically indexes this closer proximity yeah. Yeah. Um, of, of speakers. Um, so I think to get at that, we would have to separate out the different phonetic uh, 
realizations of Creek. Yeah. Um, and there certainly are. So I didn't get into this. We so for this whole talk, I've just talked about Creek as a single thing. But I have looked at um, at, at how um, Creek surfaces differently in different uh, phrase positions, for example. Um, so earlier in the phrase, Creek is um, more periodic and um, um, and has, and can be produced with higher F zeros. Okay, so this is really consistent with something that would be more labeled vocal fry um, than than creak that you get like at end syllable races. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think moving forward, it would be good to maybe tease apart these uh, acoustic realizations and, and 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 see whether different meanings are attaching to different uh, phonetic qualities. Um, yeah. Just just building on that, with your corpus that has the video, I wonder if you could get body movements or body movements attached to the type of meaning that I'm sort of uh, suggest suggest suggesting about closeness. Mm. But so, like for example, my mental idea here is like yeah. the scenario that I pick up is like leaning in. Yeah, it's like getting like lowering my body position. Like, well, come on, get over here. Yeah, yeah. It, so I'm trying to think about how to operationalize that from like a computer vision perspective. I think you probably. I think we can. No. Um, well, it would take some doing. Um, but I think the way it would, so we have these Xbox Kinect cameras oh. as well. I don't know if you've ever played like Dance Dance Revolution, <laughs> what it's called. Yeah. So the way that works is it infers a skeletal representation of the dancer um, by getting like different nodes, uh, which are like the joints of the body basically. So in that, and it gets it in an XYZ three dimensional plane. Um, so I would think that you should be able to get this leaning in from the relation of the head joint to in theory, I, I don't have the math to do that, but um, someone smarter than me could. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Robin Hooker, Wisconsin. Um, just actually following up on that, when you were talking about the different uh, phonetic realizations of creating different positions, I was also wondering just about sort of overall duration issues. Because like in the example that you showed of the sort of the sample of the, of the speaker creaking, mm -hmm. those were, that was like almost the entire intonational phrase that, yeah. that was being creaked. So in work that I've done on Greek and Hebrew in the past, I should, it seemed like they, those are very, doing very different things and you had an entire phrase being creaked versus just elements of the phrase being creaked. So I'm wondering just if you have any insights about that. I don't know what's, so absolutely things, there is, there, that is a, that's constraining the types of meanings that, that, are, um, that are arising. Um, that's based on observations, but not based on this analysis, right? So this, I have to be very clear that the, this model is really looking at individual syllables or individual vowels and whether they're creaked or not, right? Um, so it's not looking at the, the, um, whether that individual vowel is in the context of a longer stretch of speech. Um, but that could be something that we look at. Um, yeah, I can imagine a, a model where, I guess, the, the, the observation is like percent of uh, extend of creek during an IP, okay. um, yeah, which would be easy for us to do. Okay, one more quick question. Stephanie, you want to A related question about the distribution. We've been playing around a little bit with that same algorithm uh, with Darren Shaka at, at uh, OU or at MCU, and uh, trying to determine whether this uh, algorithm can reliably detect irregular pitch periods that are quite short at the beginnings of vowel initial words that, that are phrase initial. Oh, okay. And uh, so I'm wondering, um, we don't know the answer to that. We will know by November 5th. <laughs> 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 but I was wondering about the fact that you're seeing uh, the uh, initiation, phrase initiation uh, creek beginning to come in in the younger female speakers. And I'm wondering if you have any intuition from having looked, I know that this algorithm isn't going to give me answers to these questions, whether those are cases that could be regarded as are they initial in the initial vowel, the vowel initial words, or are they throughout the initial syllable vowel? I don't know. Um, yeah, I just, I, I, it's been a long time since I've looked at individual cases, and so I, I really couldn't tell you. I don't have that intuition now, but it makes me wonder whether you're likely, I'm, I'm, so I'm just thinking of whether a, a, a phrase initial vowel would occasion like the starting of a week. And then that might be an occasion for the, ex uh, the uh, extending it. Exactly. Uh, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I mean, I don't know the answer to that, but I could very easily uh, look at whether um, you get um, this extensive creak in, in, in um, 
in phrases that begin with a, a vowel, at least in terms of the um, phonemic transcription. Yeah, um, that would be something I could tell you today, probably. <laughs> Maybe I'll look at it, yeah.